I unmuted everything said. correctly over here. I didn't unmute it over here. So let's get back <laughs> to the show, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is part two, oh. part two. Uh, and uh, we've got uh, we've got some good stuff going on for you here. Uh, it is going to be all of the stuff, not including World vs. World. So first, let's just talk about general reactions. How did you like? How did you guys like the UI? How did you like uh, the the look of the game graphically? You know, everything just sort of. How, what was your initial reaction to looking at this stuff? Uh, what do you think, Kai? I was so excited. I was. I mean, from conventions, it's really hard to tell kind of the quality of the game because people are recording it on like flip cams and, you know, phones and anything and everything. And you can't really get a full feel of what the game graphics are going to be like. And we did see a few videos where it was kind of on medium low settings and they staged that and then some on really high settings. And the best video that I was like, wow, gobsmacked was AKA Mike B's tour of... Um, Oh my God, I can't think of the name. Divinity's Reach. Divinity's and Reach. you can see all the little cobbles Oh, I still have to watch those. I really wanted to watch those oh, today. I literally sat here and was I linked those to you at like 10 a.m. this morning. Hey, still I had to those. work. I got kept getting interrupted. I watched as much as I could. And I was trying to focus There's on the one. World v. World stuff because I knew I could check that other stuff later. Because oh, I, I mean, yeah. we've, we've, we've seen... made his promotion podcast. I mean, we've seen the uh, the tours of Divinity's Reach before. Yeah. Right? We we did have so, one of those videos. I really did want to see the newer one that uh, that they showed off today. I couldn't get to it, but I will eventually. But but I I did see a tiny bit of uh, this and that. So so that was one of your the most amazing things that you saw was the tour of Divinity's Reach. Yeah, just because you could see like all the yeah. cobblestones, everything, the textures on the buildings. It literally looked like something from you could compare it to like Fable on high settings. Like it was really, really good and clear. And I felt like, wow, I'm a part of this world, not just running around like Stormwind or somewhere that looked really cartoony. Like it, it looked so good, and I was really impressed with that. So freelancer, was there anything that really stood out at you while you were looking? Or Malkior, how is there anything that you? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I got to add on the Divinity's Reach. Okay. Because not many people have noticed this. It's actually multi-tiered. So you got the the kind of the, the market area in the middle where the NPCs are throughout the six districts of, of the gods. The upper area, the gardens, and the queen's quarters. Um, in Phony's video, he goes up on the wall. This area that no one has seen yet you're Ghost lagging a little bit. you can get down <laughs> yeah. into the crypt you're cutting in and out what he's saying is I'm um, sorry what he's saying is uh there's when he he linked this to me and and what everybody's seeing as far as people running around divinity's reach they don't realize that that's just one tier of the city there is actually other three tiers, tiers. And, yeah. There's three like the tiers lower, and, the middle, uh, and the I believe upper. the bottom tiers uh, if I'm not mistaken Melky are like a dungeon of some sort Am I getting that right? Is it the sewers or something? Well, there is a dungeon underneath. We, we, we don't know something. yet. We don't know, but we know that it, um, there know exists the an area there that we don't the have. From Ghost of Ascalon, it might be a dungeon. Who knows? Well, the crypts, I think, in Ghost of Ascalon are the the of of that's 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 the crypts of um, Ascalon City, way over to the to the east. I don't think that's the. Oh, oh you mean the original? The, the crypts, the, the very beginning. I yes, see what you're saying. It's literally a separate I layer forgot about that. in the in-game map. It's on the bottom right corner. And I did see somebody through tabbing the through that. To see which layer you're so you're on. saying the bottom layer was inaccessible but visible on the map. Is that about right? Yes. Okay. So that's very interesting. Yes. All right. So freelancer, what what's you know, kind of struck out at you while you were just looking at these videos. Oh, that's cool. That's a nice little touch. Or, oh, I hate what they did there. Anything in particular? Uh, well, I mean, I mentioned, like, the the UI. All right, we all know the UI is minimalistic. It's got that art style. It's beautiful, right? You know, Kai was saying it's a beautiful UI. It is, but it doesn't show anything. And I guess that's... Maybe that's just from me playing with all those add-ons. God, those add-ons. You know, we all hated them, but we all got so used to them but uh i i i miss the the targeting features i miss the targeting frames that i that i had i was actually looking forward to seeing more of that um i miss the the damage capabilities of being able to judge how well i'm performing one thing particular right, let, let's leave add-ons and stuff out of that pretend that doesn't have any bearing uh one thing i didn't like was that at the end of the public events um 
and I guess this comes from Warhammer, uh, you you don't see anything that you've done. It didn't seem to show any stats like, you know, I did this, okay, I got a bronze medal or I got a gold medal, but how well did I actually do? Did I improve upon my last time doing this event? Um, and it didn't seem to show any of that information. And if it's there, I apologize, I didn't see it, but I was really looking forward to seeing You mean kind of TF2 style? Where, I mean, it's a long well, time ago, but do you remember when you first got TF2, you kept like, congratulations, you did 200 damage that life as a pyro, and the next time you did a little bit better, it reminded you, hey, guess what, you just beat your best, you know, round as a pyro is for much damage, or you only died two times that, you know, whatever. Because Is that kind of what you're talking about? Well, more so, uh, you know, you're, at, at the very base level, I would have liked to have been able to see my contribution level. If they judge the amount of revives, the amount of healing, the amount of tanking, and the amount of damage you do. So you want to see the raw stats behind the bronze, Under, yeah, silver, I, and gold. I, I am, I, at heart, and it's probably a negative thing, I am a <laughs> min-maxer, okay? I like to squeeze every bit of efficiency out of my character, whether that be PvE, PvP, or otherwise, mainly PvP. But... I still want to have those capabilities, and I know that our guild, especially, and other everybody's guild, I mean, it will want to know how can we do this better next time. And without having those tools to look at seeing where our weak points were, uh, you know, maybe we were doing we could have done better damage, or maybe we could have done better, you know, tanking or whatever it might have been. Any number of variables. It's just having those tools to be able to improve your efficiency. I think that's a core element of gaming. And right now. They seem to have dumbed it down so much, and maybe that's the wrong term, but they seem to have brought down that level of detail so much that it's just, okay, you get a bronze award. Yay, did I do good or bad? Well, apparently you got bronze, so you did bad. Or I got a gold award. Did you do good? Well, apparently I did good. But your gold award may be nothing compared to the guy that puts his heart and soul in it, for example. And um, I just think having that ability to improve, and there's no way to tell how to improve. Okay, uh, so Kai, what were your sort of like? Hey, this is oh, actually, didn't I just ask you that? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, um, in regards to like the UI, um, I know I mentioned like what it looks like, but I a lot of people have been like, oh my god, the UI is massive, and you know it's really cluttered and crowded. But I love it. Like I could not ask for a better UI. I don't want any add-ons to change it. Um, I literally think the way it is and the way things pop up and like remind you and it's all kind of that arty texture. I love it. Like I don't want it to change at all. I think it's perfect. Yeah, and, there's, and there's, I got. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say that in terms of add-ons and such, I am very much against add-ons too. Like I really am. It's it, contrary to what it may sound like I'm saying. I just think that base things like this, like at the end, you'd of, like a little bit more functionality in the base game built, rather than allowing in. add-ons. Yeah, I, I would like maybe not damage meters because damage meters is can develop really bad habits. It can I mean, give you really a bad can. culture too in the game when it Yeah, and and, I, and like uh, what was it gear score and all of that. That's bad. I, I don't want to see that. I, you know, that stay away, okay, <laughs> from Guild Wars. Uh, but I would like to see something in terms of beyond just a gold or silver award is what I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, if I recall correctly, didn't Warhammer like it would show that you did this much and you could click on it and sort of open it up or or something that and that would sort of be at least a little bit more well, and Warhammer, I mean, Warhammer, at the end of every public event, which mm -hmm. don't, you know, don't kid yourself in saying Guild Wars was the first one to introduce this idea. They're right. perfecting it, but they weren't the first ones. Uh, and Warhammer, the public event system, had tiered difficulty and had uh, different you know, steps in order to accomplish to get to that end boss. But at the end of all that, a big chart came up showing exactly where you stood with everybody else. So you knew right away... I got a gold medal or I got second place because this is what I did. Mm -hmm. And this guy got first place, and so therefore he obviously put a lot more work into it. Whereas right now we have no way of telling between the 20 gold medals that are given out if I could have improved or not. You know, And mm -hmm. I think that's going to start developing a culture of bad players where they're going to do just enough to get by to get that gold medal instead of promoting getting better at the actual game. Yeah, I think to some extent, though, getting better at the game is the kind of thing that's either reserved for a dungeon because, hey, if you aren't better at the game, you can't pass this room. You need to be, you know, you must be this tall in order to ride the the Duke Baradin. So um, that didn't sound right at all. So the idea being <laughs> that if you're not good enough, you're not going to get past this particular boss. And that boss is going to 
force you to get better at the game in order to get past him. The other thing, of course, is PvP. If you go up into PvP, other people are going to challenge you. If you can't win against them, that is going to tell you, okay, you're not as good as you think you are. Here's where you need to improve because obviously you didn't dodge his thing, whatever. Hopefully there'll be a replay system where you'll be able to analyze your own play and determine what your weak spots are and, and things like that. So I think that's kind of the realm of improving yourself is more or less... Uh, you know, in dungeons are sort of the hard, challenging content, whereas the dynamic events are just going to be... I mean, I kind of was watching the IGN video where the guy was going through the Mesmer, and, I mean, he got through that thing just leaving his one on pretty much the whole time on auto attack <laughs> uh, and just kind of talking bomb. the whole time. And... I mean, that's kind of the thing that I was afraid of. People are all like, oh, dynamic events, don't worry, they'll be challenging when there's tons of people in there. The guy just sat there with a one and he pressed two and three every once in a while. He only, it, the only thing that he had to do actively was dodge roll out of the way, which, to be fair, is a hell of a lot more than most other MMOs give you to do in those kinds of fights. And also, to be fair, he's not a melee, so he was never having to worry about tanking the boss, and it was only a level 14 boss. So, with all of that having been said, however, I'm still not convinced that those events, even that sort of big elite boss fight or whatever that was at 14, didn't look super tough at all. It kind of looked like a snooze fest. In fact, I thought that the guy had way too much health. I mean, if the goal of this is try to determine, are you good enough to beat this guy, that guy could have had half as much health and still determined whether you could beat him. Because if you didn't die in the first, like, 10 minutes of that fight, you're not going to die in the second 10 minutes of that fight because nothing really changed. And I'm, no, I know there was he all. turned into a big thing. It slightly changed, but what I'm p pointing out is that each of those sections, before he turned into super god mode or whatever, um, you know, each of those sections independently could have been half as long, and you still would have demonstrated that you could beat the boss without having to sit there for 30 minutes. It was uh, it was really annoying to see that, and I yeah. hope not all the in events the, um, are like that. And we're all going to put uh, this on the we're going to put this on the back burner until that point that we get a silver medal after spending that 25 minutes doing a boss and you are going to be so mad because you thought for sure you were getting a gold medal you know you did so well and all the game does is tell you you got a silver medal and you have no idea how you got it i mean as far as you're concerned you you were kick ass you know and and uh, you know and, and that's going to be the point where somebody starts asking well what do i need to change in order to get a gold medal i mean if that guy that got a bronze uh, the ign guy i'm sure he's a great guy in real life but he just was horrible okay well, he, he deserved to be that fair bronze. again <laughs> to be fair he was trying to talk and explain it he yeah, did he a was. very good he job was. of talking he wasn't concentrating on doing really well he was concentrating on trying to provide a good experience for the viewer which i think he did so i'm, I'm not going to judge his play because i have tried to narrate my own play and seen it collapse <laughs> all right and this is a game that he just started playing so he actually did i think a pretty decent job for that um so for, for what that's worth i mean some, for for what i was talking about is that big ice uh sort of shaman fight that is on yeah. the ign video that's the one specifically i'm talking about that just seemed way too long and it was yeah. longer than necessary i mean even even from the get-go in the uh in the yogs cast video they were like level three fighting this level six lo low level dragon now i think it was like a mini sort of dynamic i think event. we should take anything before level 30 with a grain of salt though because that's all kind yeah, of tutorial but, but the thing but the thing that i liked about it was one was a mesmer the other one was an engineer and right from the get-go all the, it's already the game is already teaching them how to sort of bounce the the boss back and forth how to you agreed know, take, i like how that. to tank tank the damage and then you know pass it off and heal up and you know go back and forth that being said i thought the fight was entirely too long like you said it, it went on for a long time for being such a low level boss now but, it also could be that these players are all new and don't yeah. know how to play and so they were all playing very inefficiently but even if they could all have been 20 percent better in terms of timing all of their skills and taking it down faster it's still too long i think it was at least yeah. 50 percent too long and i think even even like way back when when we saw a little you know at the uh, when they were going to the shows and showing you know the Shatter pde kind stuff. of kind of kind of places it even just basic enemies were taking a while to take down, and I think that they should probably look into that once, you know, they get more feedback and everything. Right, again, we should point out, hey, it's beta. Maybe the things yeah. we're complaining about now will be fixed. So this is all... 
taken with a grain of salt because maybe they're still tweaking how long different battles should be and maybe the scaling is wrong. Maybe when you only have five people, the scaling for that event is correct, but when because they had 20 people, they just hadn't gotten the scaling correct yet and it scaled up with too much damage, you know, too much health on the boss. We still don't yeah. know that. So but again, I just, we know all that. Please don't send us emails. <laughs> We're taking this all <laughs> with a grain of salt. We're complaining about what we see, not what we think it'll be there in, in, by release. But but I love how they're the, the you're playing the tutorial. We don't. It doesn't feel like you're playing the tutorial because I think a lot of people are gonna have to really not relearn how to play an MMO. But Guild Wars is a lot different. There's no tank. There's no healer. So you need to learn how to you know when to back off and heal yourself and when to try and sort of pass the boss along. And I like how they were starting that from right from the get go. You're 20 minutes into the game and they're already trying to teach that to you. What was That's... what was impressive was um, that Ice Shaman. Um, that was like what he was level 15 around that level, right? Level 13. Um, I have to go back and watch it, but he was a relatively low level. He was in the second zone, right off the starter zone, and I think he mentioned he was like level 13. But anyways, we're talking a level 13 fight that had mechanics input uh, that were well. For those of you who didn't watch it, basically this was a fight that was pretty straightforward. It taught you one of the very basic parts of playing wow or any raid environment which is avoid the death circles you know avoid the, <laughs> avoid the, avoid, avoid the, avoid the, the big red circles don't yeah. stand there don't or stand as, in the fire as many of you know don't stand in the fire don't stand in the poop okay <laughs> and that is such a basic mechanic but any of you guys that have run in hardcore raiding <laughs> environments or raiding environments period know how frustrating it is to teach players especially <laughs> oh i can go on a rant about this but to stay out of the friggin fire i mean it's horrible and this in this boss battle uh battle the only thing this boss does is drop these icicle uh what was it like explosions well they had a first, giant then... ice it was actually really cool and it was too bad that the ign guy that i watched didn't pan the camera up because there was a massive ice elemental who was sort of doing the bidding of this ice shaman guy now you were actually hitting the ice shaman but the ice yeah. elemental was the one dropping giant icicles on the ground that shattered and probably took about half your life off. So if you get knocked by two of these things, you're down. And that happened a couple of times. There was actually a time in the fight where about a third to half of the players in the fight were down and they were all trying to get back up and they managed to pull themselves back together. And that was kind of a little exciting moment when he ran over to try to help get people up and then they helped get other people up and they started dodging a little bit better. So uh, to, for what it's worth, it did look kind of challenging for these guys that hadn't played it before. And that's, I guess, the idea. And, and this is only a level 10 a 20 fight i mean if they want to implement these kind of tactics which still kill raids even today and wow just standing out of staying out of the fire uh onyxia anybody i mean it's um imagine you know a level 80 pve content and i'm not going to be a big pve -er, but just the thought of that the fact they're introducing those elements early you know instead of just staying there and whack at the boss you know and he spawns a few mobs um is is a little. I mean, I gotta admit, I'm a little excited for that. That might just want to get me out to see what kind of true challenge can they put into these. And there was a couple of you know, dungeon fights. videos too that kind of showed some really interesting things about what you had to do in the dungeon. The guy talked about how, yeah, standard dungeon fair here, standard dungeon fair here. But here's a situation where they kind of made us think a little bit. I mean, it's not a super complicated puzzle. It's like there's a thing on the floor. When you step on it, the door opens, which means. You can have four of the five people go through, but as soon as the fifth person steps off the thing, now the door closes. And the solution to this was that... Spoilers. Spoilers. <laughs> Earbuds. Uh, Earbuds. Was that there was a rock that you could pick up and put on the thing. And that is a very simple puzzle, but maybe it was teaching you a piece that you needed to use in order to solve a boss fight later on. So you pick up the rock, you put it on this, uh, on this little thing, and now the door stays open so everybody can walk through. So that is a simple kind of different thing I, than, that may have been used more later. I didn't get through that whole video either. Um, I, I got a question. Okay. Um, Go ahead. For, for this beta, was, it, was this how the game is going to be? In that this wasn't sort of a modified build of the real game in that they didn't try and speed it up. Like, do you get thrown right into it or is it this was sort of more of a shorter version so that people could see no, more of the game. No, because what I heard happened was that you were bumped, like, they, they, you know, they started everybody at one, and then towards the end of the demo, they allowed people to directly create level 80 characters or something to that effect. 
Um, but I'm not sure about that. I kind of heard that from one or two people. Uh, but you could, of course, like I said, go into that PvP uh, area and yeah, see what yeah. a level 80 character looks like. But you wouldn't be able to experience level 80 PvE content like dungeons and things. So I think yeah. that that was allowed. Or maybe they bumped you up to level 30 <laughs> is what some people are saying. Um, anyway, uh, Kai, uh, you had some thoughts? <laughs> Yeah, it was kind of related to, you were talking about the Mike B video and things like that. Um, there was one question that I wanted to like, pose to you guys in the chat room is, what do you think about the Holy Trinity? Now you've seen gameplay, you've seen PvP, World v World, and dungeons and just dynamic events in general. Do you think there's going to be a Holy Trinity? Do you think you'll still need a healer and a DPS, for example? I have my own thoughts, but I want to know what you guys think. That, that's a good question. Now... Somebody's asking, "What's Holy Trinity?" I, I I don't know if that's a troll or if it's real because it could be real. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna assume it's real. So the the question is, "What's the Holy Trinity?" In in the previous MMOs, everybody in a organized PVE environment had a role. You were either the damage dealer, and all of your specs focused on damage and nothing else, basically, or you were a uh, a tank, and all of your specs focused on absorbing massive amounts of damage and not dying, or you were a healing class. Uh, and your all your specs focused on just plain out healing the people that are taking damage, and there was sort of a, another a subclass which was control, which is like the CC, like the warlock would have to you know dominate demons, and and you know we had the you had the the rogue that would sap people, but that was sort of a, uh, everybody had those little uh, uh, utility type skills, and that sort of transitioned into what Arena Nest trilogy is is damage support. And uh, and and uh, and sort of frontline fighter, I guess you could say. Uh, so mm -hmm. DPS support and control—that's what they said. So the the crowd control uh, is the you know person trying to make sure the mob is attacking the right people, or stunned, or slowed, and trying to kite it. And then the people that are doing the DPS are focused on DPS, and support is buffing allies, debuffing enemies, and things like that. So that's what Kai's yeah. question is. Um, I think it's going to be very difficult to say without seeing the highest, most difficult content because that is where you'll be forced to use a Trinity if the Trinity is more effective kind of a deal, yeah, right? It's very true. While you're looking at the well, low-end think... stuff, you could probably be very inefficient and still beat it. I think that it's not going to be a Trinity per se because, I mean, let's face it, there is no class that just heals or class that just tanks or class that just dps there are classes that sort of tend to sort of fit into one of those three categories but i think that in the high level stuff it's still going to come down i mean it's still i think it, during the high level stuff those particular classes, like the guardian he's going to have to play more of a support role but at the same time it may not be as bad as having the you know the healer, the tank, and the the DPSer because there is no class that could do one of those things fully. There kinda, is no yeah. healer, you know per se. There's so, I definitely mean, no healer. The, the just, just straight just out that, aren't any skills that can make someone a dedicated healer because a none of the healing skills are targetable. You can't look at your your raid group and say, "Oh, looks like the tank is down to 50% health. Better buff him up all the way to full." You can't do that. You can maybe run over near him and cast an AOE that bumps him up a little bit, but nothing is as strong as the targeted heals in the other games. So that healer yeah. straight out. And um, and I think and I think that's where the holy trinity falls apart. If you don't have a dedicated healer, then essentially you don't really have a dedicated tank. Mm -hmm. That's just that's right, just sort because, of the way I kind of look at it. Right, because a dedicated like tank to heal. He's constantly being healed. But if you don't have a dedicated tank, you're going to have to have multiple tanks trading off and trying to control the fight. Yeah. So, so I, I'm just sort of speculating that, you know, I think everyone's going to be able to do whatever the hell they want up until you're getting to the sort of end game dungeons yeah. that are supposed to be very difficult. And then at that point... You're going to have people that are obviously the Guardian is more of a support class. And I, I don't even know. <laughs> I, there's just all the other classes can fit in so many different roles. Um, I just feel like it's going to change in Endgame, that's for sure. I mean, the reason I ask it was because, I mean, in Mike B's video where he's doing the dungeon, I mean, I think just before he explained the whole dropping the, you know, the rock on the, the thing to open the door, but he talked about, you know, the Holy Trinity a little bit and he said, you know, it's 
they don't want it to be there. But does that mean that the engineer who's placing healing turrets all the time is our dedicated healer because he's constantly placing healing turrets? And I like what you said that, you know, everyone doesn't have a dedicated role and they can do anything they want to do. However, you know, when it does get to higher end game, you might find there is always one person, no matter whether it's a thief or a guardian or an elementalist, but there'll always be one person who is a we healing the group. Now, that's kind of what I wanted to get at. Do you think there will always be that one person or do you think, you know, everyone will just heal themselves? Well, the, the self heal is way stronger way stronger than I think any other healing that people can do. Um, yeah. By the way, I thought it was a really cool Mesmer heal where it healed you the more illusions that you had out. That was kind of a cool little mechanic. Um, just pointing that out because I saw that. Now, um, I do want to point out, uh, Christopher uh, uh, contacted me and pointed out that we were complaining about the length of that one fight. On every single event, and this is only visible in a couple of different um, uh, couple of different uh, uh, videos but in every single event when it completed there was a feedback box you could click and open up and and type in and it was basically asking questions uh such as you know uh you know was this too hard too easy that kind of a thing so that they could get a lot of feedback from these many testers on the difficulty curve and the length on these different dynamic events which i think is brilliant by the way that it is, is yeah. in that is fantastic uh, it's the same kind of thing that Google's been doing with all of their new tools. Every time they come up with a new thing, there's a little pop-up in the bottom that says, hey, do you like this or don't you? Why not? So that it's so easy to just send feedback to the people that are making the decision. So I love that. That's that's just another arena net innovation when it comes to testing. Well, though, somebody else has done it before. <laughs> I'm just saying. They did a good job. So yeah, that hopefully they took a liberal use of that uh, and, uh, and, and, and that's all involved. So... Wow, we just spent a good <laughs> 20 minutes <laughs> talking just about reactions. Um, so, Oh, I didn't even start talking about my reaction. Oh, yeah, that's right. We didn't get your – so did you see anything specific that jumped out at you that was just like, wow, this is cool? Um, I love the artistic style of the user interface. Mm -hmm. I think that I love when – you're handing in a quest, how there's that little sort of cinematic where you sort of have the purse, the people actually talking. It's not just a little book of text that you're reading. Um, I really like that because if you don't want to watch it, you can just skip it. And if you want to watch it, it's a nice little touch. You know, it adds a little bit to it. Um, and then just sort of like the, the character creation and all the other elements and the way they sort of, just the artistic style, even the opening cinematic, how it's not, like a lot of other games have, you know, this sort of really high-end cinematic. They did a really simple, just, um, you know, uh, concept art, sort of animated concept art, and I just think it's phenomenal. I really liked it. Yeah, the the thing that struck me was, and and I really the first thing I do when I get in a game is to really test this out and see if this is right. But I remember them talking about uh, somewhere about how the background, when you're looking at distant objects, kind of looks like concept art. And somebody kind of pointed out that it, it really does look like concept art. Like when you see a big city in the background that's way far away from you. And I wonder if it actually is just concept art. And as you get closer, it slowly transitions into the actual physical object that you can see. And that is just mm. an awesome, and I wanna like try to walk towards something and see if I can spot the point at which it changes from concept art to to physical object because yeah. that is that is just an amazing piece of technology that saves so many resources if you're just looking at a 2d image at that point yeah i i also just really liked in the game in general when you're running around they did a lot of i feel like there's a lot of background like there's nice things to look at in the background it's not just like you're running through a field and there's a couple trees here and there. You know, they, they show a city in the background or these mountains in the background and you're running through Even a canyon kind of thing. Even stuff you can't get to, you're saying. This, yeah, stuff you can't get to. It's just the, the way that they have it laid out that everywhere you look around, there's something nice to look at. You know, we're talking about all purdy stuff in the distance and stuff. One thing that drove me insane... <laughs> Oh. <laughs> Bringing us back to Earth well, with Freelancer. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, you know, I, I, 
All right, did you see the frame rates of, of a lot of these videos when they were showing all of this stuff going on at one time? Yeah. Do you think – yeah, I'm going to chalk it up to say that's just – it's beta. They're still optimizing I things, have but... seen things from people, testers, that said, uh, you know, I, I, I seen some of these other videos that have very crappy frame rates. I did not experience that. My frame rates were pretty steady the whole time through. So there were people that didn't have that problem. So I'm hoping that it's just, you know, optimization with specific driver sets and specific cards as a problem. I'm hoping. Yeah, because, like, the guy that did the IGN videos, you have to imagine that these guys probably have bleeding-edge PCs they record on and stuff. They have to. So, you know, if they have a great computer with a great graphics card, what does that mean for the rest of us looking at 40 players on screen? Um, you know, not everybody realistically has that sort of computer and it wor it worries me to an extent and this probably will be ill-founded and not you know not the case in launch but if i'm that guy that's trying to play on this laptop that could barely run starcraft 2 or if i'm that guy that is really trying to squeeze something out with a lower end computer and i want to play world versus world does it just mean that i don't have a shot period and i hope we see something in terms of computer optimiza optimization because um that those videos I saw, there was three videos in World vs. World, one of them uh, a dungeon, where the frame rate got to the point it was like at least 15 frames per second, and it was pretty jumpy, and there was only 20 people on screen. So if we're talking in World vs. World or in uh, other scenarios where you're going to have 50 characters on screen, or if you're just running around a city, I mean, yeah, Divinity's Reach is beautiful, but Divinity's, Re Divinity's Reach only had... The press beta attendees in it what happens if you're running around divinity's reach and there is the entire server there you know and yeah. uh, it's it's worrisome that's I, I, just a little thing of mine somebody, I just, somebody I just pointed really out that, that the they... last thing that they do is optimization so that's something to to to, to think about well, I, and somebody I mean, else pointed that fraps is always crap in all betas i mean has has anyone played the the diablo 3 beta i haven't no yes that, i have no. I, I just, I mean, my computer's not extremely high end, but you know, I play like Battlefield 3 on good settings and it runs just fine, and all these other things run nice. Diablo 3, for some reason, it lags like crazy and it's skipping all over the place. And this isn't a game that looks amazing, you know? I just feel yeah. like, I hope that they, that they realize that, I mean, when I saw the World vs. World stuff, I immediately started thinking about how I need to upgrade my computer because I don't. I want to look at it as the way it's meant to be looked at. I don't want to have to dumb it down. Um, but yeah, I, like I, I really hope that they know what they're getting themselves into and that they try and optimize it. Yep. All right, so let's let's try and move on here because we've got a lot to talk about. All right, so let's talk about the <laughs> trade night. system. Um, and I'm going to pull up the, the image that we have uh, that was leaked over the weekend, but obviously a lot of people talked about this particular image uh, or images like this in, uh, in, all these, in all these other videos that we saw. So we finally have some information about how the new trait system works. We don't necessarily know uh, exactly how you can acquire uh, the traits, if they're automatic or not. I, at least I don't. I, I'm thinking, I think I know how it is, but we'll see if the chat room agrees with me here. So this is an example of the trait tree, kind of like the talent tree, the equivalent of a talent tree. It's the way that you customize your class to be different from other people. Uh, and the way that it works is, as you can see, there's five categories. Each class has their own uh, separate categories. This is the necromancer. And you're going to get 70 points at level 80 to spend. And you're going to get one trait point from 11 all the way through 80. So uh, you're going to get more trait points as you level up and get more effective. Now, as far as I can tell from what I read on Guild Wars Insider and other places, as you can see, this video, uh, this picture here, the person has put in all 70 points because uh, they were probably in the PvP, you know, test area that leveled you all the way up and unlocked everything. And so he put 30 points into Death Magic, which is the maximum. Which means you can see those minor traits located at uh, 5, 15, and 25. Those are automatic. And I think what in the numbers just on the left-hand side there, the plus 300 to the shield, which I believe is defense, and plus 30% to what looks like an hourglass inside of a box, which I think is boons. So 30% bonus to the boon time, or maybe maybe that's uh, maybe that's the opposite. Maybe that's conditions that you apply to the enemy. It's one of those two. I just like the fact that I can figure that out by looking at it. Is that does that make sense? Like that's pretty freaking awesome that their iconography is that good. Um, now, so the minor traits seem to affect those specific stats, 
The major traits, however, that come at 10, 20, and 30 can have that little up arrow and you can switch them out. So that's where you can more customize. Now, my question is, and maybe the chat room knows this and I'll ask everybody, are the traits that you can pick at 10 points the same as the traits that you can pick at 20 and 30? Or are those three separate trees that you're gonna choose from? Uh, does, does anybody here know? There, there was a video I saw. Um, where the hell was it? There's a video that it showed the guy, you know, going through it, and you, you watch him as he clicks on the the major traits. Um, oh, where the hell is it now? Everybody's saying that yes, they're the same. You know, so it's the same. It's the, so you get to choose three traits, and the only reason you go deeper into the tree is you get more traits, not specific traits being unlocked later on. That's interesting. Ooh. And have all the traits already listed. Uh, <laughs> somebody put, yes, all the traits are listed on the Guru. They went through and listed all the traits and screen caps of all things. So, um, so that, that's very interesting. So the other thing that we can see on this particular screenshot is that because you have 70 traits and the maximum is 30 in each tree, you can either do what this person did and sort of min-max. You put 30 in one, 30 in another, and 10 in a third. Or you could do 20, 20, 20, 10. Or you could do like 10, 10, 10, 10, 30 or something like that. And that'll, that'll get you about there. So there's a couple different ways to do it. And one would way, make you more versatile and allow you to do many different things. And others would make you very specified. But you can always specify at least two different trees and sort of dabble in a third. Which I think is great because that means that you're going to be more versatile by, by default, I guess you could say. You can't yeah. spec in only one way. And this on top of the runes, I mean, and also... Oh, the runes, yeah. Yeah, other customization. I mean, you could really get, you know, everybody thinks, oh, they got rid of the Trinity, so now everybody's the same. But with this trait system and the runes, uh, everybody knows how the runes work, right? Yeah. Uh, basically, you, you buy runes, you place them in your armor, and there's all sorts of different kinds of runes. And... Um, they kind of act like every, set bonuses. Yeah, and then every basically every piece of armor or weapon you have can take up to six of these. And so if you put a rune of fire, just just using a very simple example, it does plus one fire damage. Well, then if you put another one in there, now it's rune of fire times two, plus two fire damage. But if you get the third one, for example, it might be rune of fire plus five damage, then maybe 10% burn damage over time or whatever. Or so cool these rooms, some other thing. Yeah, or, or it could be any number. There's tons of them. I, I was looking through these videos where they were looking at room uh, vendors just from uh, the, the Ascalonian dungeon area. And, I mean, just that alone was impressive. And then there's so many of them all throughout the game, and that'll kind of encourage you to go to these PvE areas and unlock these. Um, but uh, the way these work is in combination with your traits, you can actually really get into you know i want to focus 100 percent on my staff and these particular skills associated with the staff i really that's the ones i really like using i want them to go full blast and, and you could do that um or you could be that guy that says uh death magic you know necromancer i, I want to be that guy that throws a bunch of debuffs on uh on the enemy so i'm going to spec into that and also get runes that associate with that yeah, runes so, that increase you know duration of conditions that you place on the other ones there you go yeah. bam uh, and, and somebody's asking, and I, I should point out, uh, there is a respec button right on the, the, the panel of this image. I mean, you can see it right at the top. Now, who knows if, that, if it's going to be that easy in the actual game to just click refund traits and do it again as many times as you want for free. Maybe respecking will cost a nominal amount of gold. Who knows? But for right now, it's free, apparently, because you just click on refund traits at the top there. Or at the very least, it's easy. It might cost a bit of coin, so we'll have to find now out. Do we have anything that we've seen so far that suggests you can save traits? Like, save if I want to have, yeah, like uh, one thing. Uh, obviously, all of you PVPers have done in WoW is uh, have different, you know, trait sets depending on who you're teaming up with. Um, mm -hmm. If have we seen anything like that? And if not, I would imagine that would be an ideal cash shop item. Uh, small that just saves you time and makes convenience. Yeah. I mean, that, that's not many, many people idea. are going to use it, but. 
you know, I, for I'd pay somebody for that. That if I if I was going through a number of different builds, and I, I would just pay for the convenience to not have to worry about. Oh, now I just got to do my traits because now I'm going with freelance. Yep. Or freelance always plays a mesmer, and when he plays a mesmer, I don't need this set of traits. I need that set of traits because exactly. he's a jerk and yep. he keeps playing with me, and then he doesn't <laughs> play with me, and then he plays with me again, and then he goes and plays with somebody else, and I have to keep changing my traits. Why do I have to keep changing my traits? He should change his traits around me. Or, or I could trait myself to say I need a lot more healing because Bridger gets himself killed. Oh, here we go. Oh. <laughs> Here we go. Do we even know if you can have two different kind of trait but points? That's, that was the question, Kai. Yeah. Whether you I mean, can have you know, builds. I hope, so. yeah. I hope so. I'm guessing if it's not in there, it's going to get in there because that's something that everybody's going to request. There should be like a main spec and an off spec per se because, for example, like the Elementalist, you can, you know, put your traits all in like, like fire, League magic, of Legends and room water. pages. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, for a short, for a small fee of fifty dollars, you can have as many rune pages as you want. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see how that goes. Um, I, I hope, I hope that they keep the refund either free or very, very cheap. Because if they want, if they if the whole concept is that every class could do every role, theoretically. Yeah. If you set your traits to do one thing. And then you have to pay to reset them to do something else. I, I would imagine it's free. It almost seems I like really it think almost it seems be. like it. If you could just refund it and change right on the fly right away, that that'd be ideal for sort of their game philosophy they've been going with so far. Yeah, I, I have to imagine it's going to be free. Um, and, and and I just oh man, I can't wait to start playing around with all these traits and stuff. Obviously, it's an incomplete system because as you can see, every trait has exactly the same icon. I'm sure that once they you know get deeper into the system, the traits are all going to have unique icons or or maybe unique to show what they do or something like that. So we'll we'll see more on the trait system. I think sometime in the near future, maybe even the next month or two, we'll probably see a blog post about it, something to that effect. So uh, here's hoping for that. Um, so we'll, we'll we'll come back and revisit traits maybe when we know some more about it. Maybe they'll discuss yeah. how, what we're talking about, different builds, and whether you can save them or not. Um, any any kind of brief thoughts you guys had on character creation? Did you guys watch any of those videos? I didn't really get a chance to watch yeah. it, but I thought I'd yeah, throw it in there. I watched a few videos, but I just kind of, as I said, like at the beginning of the first um, stream we did, I was kind of a bit like, yeah, I've already seen it. Like at they have shown it off. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it was more complete here. It. Yeah, I mean, definitely for like the non, it like I saw a lot of non character creation. It was good to see like the different females and AKA Mike B's video was really good. Like how he made right. the girl look All right, that's the name then... of this show. Fat Norn are amazing. RPG <laughs> Mancer just threw it into the channel. I think that's what we have to call the show. <laughs> but somebody else pointed out that when it comes to human women, no fat chicks allowed, apparently. <laughs> that's just That's just what it is. Wait, you, you know what else? I liked um, the whole setting up your personal story when they ask you those questions. Like the when they was going through the Norn, they kind of ask you these questions. You got to answer them, and that sort of determines your kind of character. But then immediately, as soon as you start going into those little one-on-one -on -one cinematics when you're kind of handing in a quest or something, you can immediately see your personality as being a cocky bastard that, oh, I'm going to kill that thing and blah, blah, blah. And, you know... And it, it right away you can see how it translates into the game, and I think that's really cool. Okay, I don't want to get too hung up on character creation because we have seen a lot of that. Uh, let's talk. Besides, we we all know everybody in World versus World is going to be a sir anyway. <laughs> <laughs> here we go. We're not talking about that again. I'm cutting it off right here. No more. So uh, let's jump in and talk about the Mesmer a little bit. Did you guys uh, take a look at Mesmer videos? Did you have any? Did you see anything that was particularly awesome? What do you think about the class now that you've seen it in action? Oh, I kind of want to play it a little bit, a little a teeny weeny incident. Is that so? Before, did you want to play it a lot, and now it's less, or before no. you're like screw it, and now you're like, eh, maybe I'll give it a shot. Before I was kind of like, ugh, that'll get boring. And then now I've actually seen it played, like people who were just like, I don't even know how to play the Mesmer and I face rolled so much. And I was like, oh God, I've got to play this thing. And like, apparently the illusions and things like that are really believable. And I've actually seen many videos of people actually attacking the illusions. So I'm like, God, how dumb are you? But they must be like that believable. So it just kind of makes me want to play. Bridger, we're talking to Kai here. She's going to roll Savari Mesmer that has pink butterflies flying around her. Hey. <laughs> <sighs> I'm going to get like 10 more emails from the feminists going, what are you it doing? Fire coming. freelancer. Uh, <laughs> and I should point out, as somebody pointed out in the chat, it, humans are not just no fat chicks. It's no fatties, period. 
or sorry, thick people, you have to go with the Norn. Um, <laughs> somebody pointed out. Um, thick people. Thick people. That's what it is. I'm. It's, it, they're husky. They're not. They're they're big boned. You know. Uh, they are. They're nine feet tall. They better be big boned, or they're not going to stand up very easily. Um, so. The mesmer. That that uh that video that you posted, I after seeing some videos of the mesmers fighting, I think they look fun, um, but I'm still sticking by my guns literally and still rolling an engineer. I haven't, I haven't changed from that. But I think the mesmer after seeing it now, um, I think, I don't know. It's hard to say how they're gonna react, but I think they look cool. I'll just say that. Definitely. Yeah, and- they look cool, but I'm gonna be an elementalist. Like I'm. Like, I'm not going to be a mesmer, but I kind of, like, want to try it for the fun, but I'm not going to roll it first. All right, Kai, virtual high five. <laughs> Mesmers all the way. I mean, uh, elementalists all the way. <laughs> Dang it, I screwed that up, too. I'm seriously going to make an elementalist. That That's that joking. mesmer mind trick telling There's you to say that. There's a mind trick. That's right, yes. Uh, <laughs> what's the name of the, oh, the queen, uh, <laughs> the queen in, in Divinity's Reach. She's, she's reaching into my mind and telling me to roll a mesmer. Um, so here, here's uh, my thought. And if you haven't seen it, by the way, guys, I got a link in the show notes. There's an awesome, amazing fight between a mesmer and a, what was it? it's a thief that really kind of shows off how both classes can use their invisibility and their, and their AOE abilities. And it was like this dance. It was like this epic fight that lasted for about two or three minutes around a control point in a structured pvp match and you know it, it i don't know if it was fantastic gameplay but it was a lo- it was it was somebody that clearly kind of knew what their class could do and was actually using some of the features correctly and i have to say uh if you haven't seen it that kind of really shows you how detailed these fights can get it gives you an idea um and i'm sure it even gets better than that but uh, it's about nine minutes into the link that i put down there it's under mesmer if you're looking for it it's just titled amazing fight definitely definitely check that out I um, hope I hope that the the caliber of those fights translate to other classes as well. Agreed, agreed. That was definitely a very cool fight. And having seen that fight, and uh, having seen um, the uh, the 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 mesmer, you know, PVE, despite the fact that the the player wasn't doing a fantastic job with the the mesmer, he was kind of showing it off how it worked and all that stuff. I think that. <laughs> the the phantasms and the clones i think they'll work okay i was especially concerned about the shattering mechanic um that basically like okay so i've got these ranged phantasms and when i shatter them they're going to do aoe but they're nowhere near the enemy but then i realized watching that video that when you tell them to shatter and do damage or put conditions or whatever confusion on the enemy they actually run straight at the enemy and then explode they don't do it at long range so they go at the target that you've chosen so and there's also some really cool sort of synergies between the classes so I don't know. I thought that was really cool. So, uh, Freelancer, you're always the one that was looking really hopeful about the Mesmer, and then you were disappointed when you learned more about it, and then you were hopeful again. Where are you at now? Uh, I gotta be honest. I think I'm pretty much set on Mesmer, assuming that the thief is still broken. <laughs> oh, the controversy, <laughs> but I mean, that's that's what it is. Now, what, um, what is your basis for saying that the thief is broken? You, you Because of the range issue? The range issue, stealth mechanic. I mean, it, I think the whole class. I think even the, the arena net devs are still scratching their heads on how they're. Now, are you, know, you what just talking in about. world versus world? Because I think that uh, the I'm thieves are going to be PvP. great in structured PvP in those smaller environments. I think the thieves are going to be great assassins in those environments. Well, I, all right, I'll be straight with you. I go. I usually like. I know a lot of players like this. I go after the class that has the highest skill cap. And so when I'm looking at these classes uh, and I'm breaking down their different skills, like they had a mouse over a YouTube video that went over every Mesmer skill uh, mm-hmm. unlocked in that little mode we were talking about. They also went through uh, Thief and Warrior, and I think I looked at Elementalist as, as well. And it kind of confirmed a worry of mine that certain classes are, are kind of geared towards play styles. And like the Elementalist, for example, was very much straightforward. A, I do damage, I heal, and I have a few buffs here and there but that's basically what i do so a lot of people will find the elemental is fun to play because it's very straightforward in what it does the thief um you know i played a rogue all throughout wow i played assassin and aeon i played uh, a witch hunter and um and warhammer and all of those were get in kill glass cannon type classes but the thief in um in uh guild wars 2 just doesn't seem to have that bursty capability and that may be fine i mean it just doesn't have that. The Mesmer, however, uh, if you look at the skills, the utilities, and I can't name any directly off the top of my head. I'll just browsing through them. Freelancer. 
but I just gotta say, the Elementalist is the highest skill cap of all time. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna get, I'm, we're gonna get hate mail for me saying that. I just no, know no, it right now. I, I, I can see how it could be straightforward. I just think, I'm hoping that this that this, there's one weapon set or two that have a lot more control elements to them, because I think that a control element this would be really fun. But go ahead, I just wanted to throw yeah. in the pop so, culture dis reference. Disclaimer that freelancers' <laughs> thoughts do not reflect all of Tales of Terror's stuff. Please send all feedback to yeah. feedback at Tales of I am, I am but one guy, and, and not a very... No, you know, I haven't touched Guild Wars 2, so I can't, so you, know, you know. I have if a you... theory that Freelancer just wants to play the uh, profession of the highest skill cap, so he can say he's better than everyone else. <laughs> oh, <laughs> She's ouch. saying what we're all ouch. thinking! <laughs> ouch, ouch. <laughs> but just no. for, for the record, if you guys do have any feedback, send it to feedback at talesofteria.com, because actually all the hosts get that, so... Yeah, you can tell Freelancer why he's wrong if you're in an email format, if you want I love I love the criticism. Bring it on. <laughs> yeah, no, we all do. It's good. Um, okay. So, Mesmer's, let me, let me Mesmer's finish. cool. Finish, finish Mes your thought. Well, just to cap it off, Mesmer, if you go through the skills they have, uh, seems to have... Um, you're gonna look, two people are going to look at it in two different ways, depending on what kind of person you are. Either A, you're going to say that those are the most gimmicky skills out there, <laughs> and you're going to say it's so OP because you don't know how to deal with it. We went over this in a previous episode. Uh, or B, you're going to say that this is way too complicated for me. And either one of those scenarios sounds like my type of game because it's going to take a lot more to learn those. Um, you know, there isn't any really hardcore direct damaging uh, skills and stuff. Everything involves multi-tiered setups. And I think when I'm going 1v1 or 5v5 and on arena team uh, against other players, I think that's going to be a big advantage to be able to confuse the enemy like that. I'm done. There you go. <laughs> All right. So uh, I think that uh, kind of wraps up. We're trying to get through a bunch of stuff, so there's probably more to say about the Mesmer, but I want to kind of move on to guild mechanics. Uh, yes. So this, this is something that everybody's wanted to talk about because, you know, actually we spent a good deal of time today on the, uh, on the team speak. And if you guys weren't there, it was amazing. Everybody in Team Legacy showed up in one big channel and we're talking, did you see this? Oh, hey, check out this. Did you see this picture? Oh my God, look at this. And oh man, I'm watching this bit of video of World vs. World. Look at this siege engine. And oh my God. Oh man, look at this mesmer. He doesn't know what he's doing. I wish I saw somebody. It was amazing. So uh, definitely <laughs> check out the Team Legacy uh, uh, team, team speak server. You can find the info at the top of teamlegacy.net because we're always there and we've been having a ton of ton of fun discussing all this stuff. It's kind of like, uh, you know, a Tales of Tyria with slightly more sober, refined tastes. In most cases. In most cases. Plus tons more people to interrupt you. Um, so there's that. Uh, so, yeah, let's jump onto the guilds here. <clears throat> the guild mechanics are very cool. So, from what we've been able to understand, and I'll try to throw a little overview here, the way that the guild mechanics work is when you're representing a guild, Pretty much everything that you do earns influence points for the guild. And this is kind of something that we already knew. It's kind of, you know, being th rolled into to, to the discussion. And it appears that finishing dynamic events gives you a good chunk of, of, uh, of influence points. Finishing structured PvP gives you a whole bunch of influence points. Especially, I think, if you do it with your guild. In both of those situations, it's sort of boosted. Uh, so it's it's greater than the sum of its parts. So if you go and do a structured PvP match, you get X. And if you go with a friend, you get, you know, two and a half X instead of just two X. So if you go with another friend in the same guild as you. So doing things with your guild mates is, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, chat room, but I think that's sort of the multiplier, is doing things with your guild mates gives you a lot more IP. Now, doing events, doing structured PvP, and doing world PvP all give you this, um, these influence points. And even doing solo stuff, like your personal story, even if it's by yourself, still gives you some IP, though it's not nearly as much as if you're doing stuff with your guildmates, as far as I can tell. And so you'll be able to go into your guild panel. It'll show you all the things that your team has done in the last couple of days. Sort of a little news feed that says, you know, okay, the guild today has done this many events and they've gotten this much IP from it. And the guild has done this many events in World vs. World and they've gotten this much IP. And so then the guild gets to spend those points. Obviously, only certain ranks within the guild have the choice of what to spend it on, and, uh, and, and that's sort of determined by the guild setup. You can set up permissions for each rank like a standard guild system in any MMO. And the things that you can you know, spend those points on are all over the place. You can spend it on a global buff that makes everybody in the guild gain XP faster. 
for 24 hours, 12 hours, something like that. Or you can spend it on a specific thing that uh, that makes all of your world versus world keeps have extra health regen on the on the NPCs or something to that effect. And there's a there's a great video uh, showing all these off. Um, I believe it was the curse video. So freelancer, talk to us about those upgrades. And there's some that are permanent and some that are not permanent, right? In terms of the keeps and stuff. In terms of just uh, the upgrades that you can give to your to your guild. Well, I mean, uh, I think the most notable are in World versus World, but they had they split it into four categories. Uh, try to recall this off of memory here, so forgive me if I get one wrong. Uh, you had architecture, you had art of war, you had uh, economy, economy and, and one more. Politics. Help me out here. Politics. There you go. Politics. So the idea is that your guild essentially will um, take all of this and over time your guild mates, I should say, will earn influence doing all sorts of different events. So you'll be, uh, you know, killing those PvE events we talked about, or you'll be doing World versus World, and you'll be pulling all of this influence into your guild to spend on these different upgrades. Now, any of you guys that played EVE Online, uh, you pretty much already know how this works, because it works very similar. You'll assign these tasks that your guild learns. Uh, now, that task could be leveling up uh, the, the architecture level, for example, or the Art of War, which is basically... You know, uh, you can only PvP choose stuff. to build upgrades a certain number of slots available for your guild. So yep. if you only have one slot available, you can only have one thing upgrading with your influence at a time. And maybe it's okay. I want we want a bigger guild bank, and that takes two days or so to upgrade. I'm just making up numbers here. Or we want to get a boon that we can turn on at any time that will increase our IP from world versus world specifically by 10% for three days or for you know 12 hours or whatever the number is. So these kind of upgrades are either permanent, like the bank, or they give you access to a boon that you can turn on for the whole guild at any given moment. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, and then moving on, um, just to kind of give you specifics is, um, you know, you upgrade these, you get your bank, et cetera, et cetera. But one of the exciting things I noticed about this was uh, if you took the time to pause the video, Bridger, did you see all of the like the PvP related upgrades? Now, thankfully, I didn't see anything relating to structured PvP. We had somebody ask in chat earlier what I thought about that. I didn't see anything that would affect structured PvP because, frankly, I don't think that's fair anyway. Um, but in terms of world versus world, there were uh, guild catapults, you know, that would take cost less supply. There were guild siege golems that would cost less. I think it. I mean. Kai, I'm sure you're with me on this. If we had a siege golem that bared our logo on his chest, you know, charging, toward, <laughs> charging towards the, would... the enemy keep. I mean, is that not the coolest thing ever? That, um, that would be cool. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, that and, um, I mean, there's numerous, like, fort upgrades. You could spend influence on mm -hmm. uh, getting some free bonuses in terms of the way you collect supply. Uh, there was attack power or power upgrades. Now, I'm not sure exactly how power is related, but I'll give you an example. There was one where you could spend, I think it was like 500 influence number could be off, where you would get 40 power or bonus power. It was like now, a not... stat. It's the equivalent of like strength, dexterity, stamina, those kinds of okay. things. All right. well, then that that was one of the that's... attributes that your so characters have. That gives your entire guild, I, I would assume, yeah. that bonus power during World vs. World. That's a pretty big buff. Yeah, I well, mean, we don't know imagine... how big the. I mean, it could be that by the time you get to level eighty, you're 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 rocking, you know, six hundred, and so yeah, that forty for, isn't for... as big of a number. But I assume it's some kind of significant. Let's say it's five or ten percent. So it's uh, it, it's just the fact that all of that's available, and they haven't even scratched the surface of guilds. I don't mm -hmm. even think this beta was focused on guilds in general. They just kind of threw in the last minute stuff they had finished on guilds. Um, I don't know if you guys read uh. Guru, uh, one of the staff members, I think it was Jen, it might be mistaken, uh, that posted a big old thing on, on guilts. Uh, and she said herself, and, and I fully believe it, that this is just scraping the surface. I, I think we'll see categories of things you can research, and guilds will be will blow like World of Warcraft guilds and, and Warhammer guilds out the water as far as terms of leveling up. Because it's not just leveling up, it's developing the guild structure, your banks, your... Uh, I'm sure auction house stuff. Your uh, the politic uh, the politics itself was interesting, and they didn't really go into that much yet. So I'm excited, very excited. Okay, very. So, I'm just reading the <laughs> chat here. People like Total Biscuit because he's legend. Wait for it, Derry. <laughs> so that happened. Um, 
All right, so the uh, the thing that I thought was really cool in the guild mechanics is they basically built in the same kind of guild level up system that you find in WoW right now or that Warhammer had, except instead of sort of making, okay, once you get this much XP from your guild, you can open a bank. Once you get this much, then you can open a guild something. Then you can get this guy. They let you kind of pick and choose. How do you want to upgrade first? What's more important? Is a bank more important to you or is it more important to get that special, you know, guild... Uh, uh, you know, weaponsmith that can spe spe sell you special, your guild mate special, you know, guild related stuff for the tabard maker or what have you. So you can sort of pick and choose. And also that a lot of these boons and buffs and things that you can get are specific over time so that you can sort of choose when to use them. Okay, maybe you're having a big, you know, holiday weekend and you bump out all the buffs. Spend them all on this weekend. It'd be crazy. <laughs> so I don't, maybe there's a limit to how many you can have at any given moment apply. But uh, that's it's still you really notice cool. The, uh, did you notice the guild ah, spit this out the guild merchant as well where you could spend a amount of money to get influence directly yes i thought that yeah. was interesting i don't know if that's exactly you know <laughs> it's a big uh, incentive to screw around with the yeah, auction house one of them much, is but... a like toast to the guild for the cost of a few drinks will toast your guild and increase your guild's influence by 10 points yeah, yeah. i like how Did they you see how much it costed yeah it costed <laughs> quite a oh. bit <laughs> That, I think there, there was Still four there. tiers. There was four of them, and I remember yeah, I, and I studied that picture. I was I was on it, and I was looking. It was like twenty silver, and then a couple more. It was like fifty, et cetera. And then it was a hundred gold, where it filled the entire city with your you know various banners and stuff. And you know that's that's exciting. I mean, who doesn't have guild pride? I mean. Mm -hmm. I love my guild. Everybody loves that. their guild. <laughs> I, I mean, who doesn't want to blow that money just to have it up there for a day or two? I mean, come on. Yeah, well, so, not really bragging rights. Well, maybe it is. <laughs> I, if you're throwing your banner all over the place, that is, of course, bragging rights. What do you think guild bank money is for? <laughs> I like the idea that for that system, they wanted somebody to be able to pay you know, in-game cash, in-game coins that you get from loot drops and everything, gold, whatever, in order to get influence. Like, if, you're, if, if your guild doesn't have anything else to buy with their coins because you got all the gear that you want, what are you going to do with that money? Well, you can go and spend it to, 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 make, to give more influence to the guild. But rather than just come up with, okay, here, give us money and we'll give you influence, they came up with a fantastic sort of lore RP kind of reason. Like, okay, if you go to the city and you buy everybody in the whole city a round of beer then oh, obviously you'll get a lot of influence with them. They're like, I like Team Legacy. There's those guys that gave us all that free round the other night. Yeah, go Team Legacy. <laughs> you'll drink to that, whatever, right? So I love that they gave that sort of uh, RP reasoning behind it. It's fantastic. A, a little it's off attention topic, to detail. Has, has there been any videos on the whole little, like, mini games and the bar fights that they were talking no, about? No, I, I haven't I seen any. No. I, I was mentioned. upset that you just said buying buying beer for everyone. I would just buy a beer for everyone to get them drunk just to start like <laughs> citywide bar fights. Yeah. Now that would be interesting. Fun. So, but, our resident troll. <laughs> <laughs> I want to whack a chair on freelancer's head. So. <laughs> There's a lot of cool info on guilds. We'll probably get another blog update, and we'll talk more about guilds at that point. Somebody wanted to point out, um, what about uh, capture, guilds capturing keeps in World vs. World? Because they did mention that a little bit in the, uh, in the blog post from last week about World vs. World. They specifically mentioned that guilds will only be able to claim one objective in, guild ver in, guild, um, in World vs. World. So what is your thoughts on that? Kai, you're leading a guild. What is your thoughts of being limited to only one objective flying your banners? Um, I get objectives, and I think for big guilds, it would be unfair for us to go around and capture every objective and have our <laughs> banner flying around, and it would literally be like the deuces server. I think, I mean, as much as it's a nice idea, like it would be horrible for the guilds, you know, maybe have like 50 members who just want to capture a small keep in, you know, the home server, and, you know, I do think it's unfair. It's a nice idea, but yeah, I think to be happy in the game, you know, it is best to limit it to one. Because, you know, we can pick the biggest and best one and, you know, take over Team Legacy. It's no problem. <laughs> what the deuce? Um, I think he missed it. I think he missed that. <laughs> oh, deuces. So I was going to funny deuces earlier. everywhere. We're going to be referred to as douches. Oh, that's not cool. <laughs> no, that's not funny. That was on our actual guild. It was someone in our guild said, I hope someone doesn't refer to us Kai, as Kai, 
I, I know for certain that even if we're slaughtering you, we will give you hearts and send you kisses and love as we're doing it. Yep. So. <laughs> That's how we roll. Team Legacy, we'll hug you as we throttle you, I guess. Is that, Achievement is that unlocked. <laughs> Caring murderer. Sure. Okay. So uh, One thing that worried me about claiming keeps and stuff is, um, is the fact that you could have, I mean, they created that system so technically you're giving all guilds an equal chance to um, you know, claim claim stuff for themselves because everybody wants to have that little plot of land they call home. Um, but it's it's a little worrisome because I see nothing so far that suggests that I can't just create. I mean, with the members of my guild, five, seven, ten different guilds just to claim a whole map for myself. I mean, I don't see anything that avoids that because a we can be in different guilds. So you know, I'll just join all the guilds at the same time. Hell, we'll run. <laughs> We'll run 10 team legacies and claim the whole entire center map. Just, you know, and not that we'd actually do that, but the fact that some that possibility is there for somebody to do that. Um, I, I just. Beating the system. Yeah, it's kind of redundant, don't you think? And, um, I mean, maybe you can't do that. And, and I hope that's not the case. But that's that was my thoughts on the matter. What do you think, Bridger? Um, well, to be honest, <laughs> I had Caught a bird. So <laughs> so I didn't hear what you just said. No, she's okay. going crazy uh, in the other room. She hears me talking. We, we had talked about it. We had talked about it earlier today about uh, forming multiple guilds to claim. Uh, oh, guilds. oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a very. I, I, there has. They have to have some way to block that, right? I mean, that's just the obvious thing. If if you're a guild of like a hundred people, you just make you know three guilds, and all hundred people are in all three guilds. And then you just okay. This group is going to go over and take that one as as you know, you know, team awesome one, team awesome two, and team awesome three. You're just going to claim three separate keeps, even though they're all really the same organization for all intents and purposes. I don't know how they're going to deal with that. Background bird is now foreground bird, but you have to be quiet. Maybe maybe <laughs> they'll have something that you can only be part of a guild. Uh, I can't know. That won't work. It's, it's hard to figure out. It's like how are like you going to catch like if that? You're part, if you're part of three guilds and one of those guilds already owns a keep, you yourself can't help claim another keep for a different guild you belong uh, to kind of thing. Maybe. Or maybe if there, if, if too many people within the same guilds are, 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 uh, are basically like, – like if X percent – of guilds share the same members, they can't both claim a keep simultaneously, you mm -hmm. know, on the server. That's something that might work. Yeah. Somebody I in mean, the chat, some, somebody in the chat's like, uh, Rena, that's probably watching this and saying, oh, we didn't think of that one. No, I'm <laughs> sure they thought of it. Come on, have a little trust. I, I, I think, it, I, I hope, I hope that they find it because I feel that kind of breaks it. I like the, the idea of, you know, you can only sort of claim one keep kind of thing i do too i think it's necessary i don't i don't like i don't like a guild having a monopoly over everything you know let let the smaller guilds take the the camps and the towers and the smaller things and leave the big keeps to the bigger guilds um, i i would love to play off the honor system and think that all guilds out there that we come across are going to be all nice and dandy and they'll say oh sure we'll help you take this keep and we'll let you claim it too but that's just not going to happen so you're going to have these guilds running around trying to do that unless it's fixed and it will be but in the current state they'll be running around and they will be insert your word here and pretend to help you and then have some guy that just spun off on this other guild claim it real quick you know just to have a third or fourth keep um, I mean, I, I hope that World vs. World encourages most guilds. This is my message to you guild leaders out there. Reach out to the smaller guilds, regardless of how the system works, and say, look, we already have this keeper, we already have this tower, and, and we're content. Help them anyway. Help them get their own thing, because there's going to be a lot of players that form their little friend guilds, right? It's they about have... server morale. You want your server to be enjoying World versus World, or they're gonna leave, and then they're gonna you're you're one you know kick ass awesome guild that talked down to all the noobs is now all alone. You don't want yeah, that. And, yeah. and it's it should be you know in, instead of saying well we already claimed our keep so we're gonna go do our own objectives, um, it should be more along the lines of thinking in the broad more broad picture that these are also guilds that will be potentially helping you down the road. And to show that that little sense of uh, humanity, e-humanity, e e we'll call it, um, 
you know, it reflects, it, it develops a reputation. So please, when you go into World versus World, don't be that guy, that guild that goes around and thinks of only yourselves because there's going to be a time later on when your server is coming up against a really tough uh, opponent, another server, and you're going to need their help. And they're going to be like, well, you remember that time that you guys just thought of yourselves? And, um, you know, then you're going to be banging your head against the wall and you'll exactly. reform your guild or something. So. There you go. That's my message when to all the guild When Team Legacy comes a knocking, you're going to want the whole server backing you up. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> well, just just any, I mean... They're going to want the backup of deuces. I just, yeah. I see it, though. Do you not see guilds doing that? I mean, it's just, I, I see that right now. Oh, yeah, now. I can totally see. I mean, that's, it. these kind of games, you know, time spent makes me feel better about myself because numbers go bigger, and then I get to put other people down because they haven't spent as much time with me. It's it's just an easy ego boost. It's sort of a lazy lazy man's uh, psychology experiment almost. It's it's very weird. But um, uh, anyway, we're getting kind of off topic. <laughs> but yeah, that, I think that's guild mechanics. The bird wants to go on. We only have uh, like one more thing to talk about. Really quickly, I wanted to point out that I finally figured out when the utility skills seem to unlock. It seems to be at level five you get a utility unlock, then another one at ten, another one at twenty, and the elite opens up at level thirty. I didn't don't know if we ever learned that before but that's a cool little detail now here's the last thing uh the forest of niflahel niflel niflel i don't even know it's the new pvp map the first one was called the battle of kylo we knew all about that before but this one is i think the one that we saw a sort of a preview of on the uh the guild wars insider screenshots a while ago this one has some very interesting uh pieces to it and, and i didn't get to watch the videos of it but i read through some of the synopses um, there are three points, and there's a mine close to one team, uh, a henge, what the hell's a henge, close to the blue team, and there's a central keep, of course. In addition, however, as opposed to having, uh, trebuchets in this map be the gimmick of the map, this one has powerful NPCs that can be killed by either side to get 50 points. And remember, the goal of the game is to get to 500, so that's actually one-tenth of the score. If you take both of those out, you're one-fifth of the way there. Uh, and then controlling the points is the rest. Also, killing these powerful NPCs gives you buffs. Now, this is going to put a really interesting spin on the game, because Freelancer, Kai, you guys know that when you're fighting in League of Legends, those neutral buffs like Dragon and Baron really focus mm -hmm. combat a lot, because if you can get in there and sneak in there when the opponent's not looking and get an easy kill on those things, that can make a big difference. But on the other hand, if the opponents can catch you while you're fighting that uh, neutral monster and you're already weakened by the fact that you're fighting it, then they might have a huge upper hand to try and make a comeback. That is just a really cool system. Yeah, and when people flash in and get the buff last minute because they got the last bit, that's <laughs> annoying. I don't know. Well, that was, that's the question. If, if I start... Uh, we're almost done. If I start, uh, you know, going uh, with blue or what have you, not blue or whatever, some kind of buff, um, if I start with one buff and you come in at the last minute and last hit it, what does that do? Is it who does the most damage? I don't know. Yeah, well, that's yeah, one of those gosh. iffy things. You know, the same question could be applied to the guild keep claiming thing. You know, is it the guy that comes in last? You know, I, I would think that they would probably use whoever did the most damage. But then that also has a downside because then it would be uh, who can do the most damage and then pull out, you know, and um, I don't know. It, it works. I, it would have to be the last hit. I mean, that's what I would imagine it would have to be. But... Uh, yeah, it's it's exciting. I mean, anybody that plays League, if you don't play League, I mean, these buffs that they provide, and, and as Guild Wars 2 is, is describing them to be really powerful, it, it's not something you can just simply ignore. And 50 points? I mean, that's a lot of points. And if how often does this thing respawn? Do we know that? Uh, you don't... I was looking it up. Uh, so maybe if somebody in the chat room knows, they can point us in the right direction here. Uh, but I would guess that since these matches only last 15 minutes they might not respawn at all if there's two of them that could take a little time to actually get down yeah i mean it, it's it's a pvp uh map nonetheless i'm still looking forward to the map that doesn't have these variables in it <laughs> um <laughs> call me a stickler but it's uh it's still one of those random you know things that i don't think um Will will become the most popular map out there. It's a beautiful map, though. I think we can all Somebody agree with that. Somebody said a five-minute respawn. That might be correct. But yeah, if, so. but I mean, you know, games like Dota and League of Legends, they have that sort of same mechanic, and they are still competitive. And yeah, they they are. 
can't deny that. Um, it's still, though, I mean, I think a lot of players, especially those running tournaments, um, granted, League of Legends is the exception. They're going to be looking for, I mean, especially your hardcore players are going to be looking for those arenas that don't have those type of variables. They just want to see the skill players of these five players versus these five, or skill levels of these five players versus these five players. So uh, we'll see. And I mean, I guess it also depends is this this monster that holds these buffs, what kind of skills does he have? Does he have a random stunning skill? And and that's kind of mm. a variable too to consider. Because then one team or one well, hopefully caster... hopefully dodgeable or something like that. There would be yeah, some one, skill one caster, one caster could argue that he got, that the mob got a lucky stun off and that led to a chain stun from the enemy team and that may have not have happened because it was a chance thing and so that's that's the key question here now if this is just a mob that's really tough has a lot of hp and doesn't have anything that throws status effects then it's not going to be an issue i think it'll be an awesome map absolutely all right guys Whew, we have gone a long <laughs> time here uh we we're kind of running out of things there's a few more things we didn't cover but i think we got to wrap it up here for tonight uh thanks everybody for tuning in i uh I don't have anything special to end the show with tonight, but uh, it, let's just say I can't, whew, I, we're almost there. I can't there. believe we had 350 to 400 viewers for the yeah, entire we had a 470 two and a half at hours. We, we capped out yeah. at 492. There you go. Yeah. That's Chris awesome, guys. This many for this long. Thank you Thank for you. tuning Thank in. You all. Please send us feedback. Feedback at TalesOfTeria.com. If you have yeah. things that you think we didn't talk about that we should talk about next week, normal recording is 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Sunday for our new listeners. TalesOfTeria.com. There's going to be an audio version of this as well as a YouTube version of this uploaded tomorrow. So keep tabs on TalesOfTeria.com to check it out. Also check out the new TeamLegacy.net, the revamped website. Lots of new stuff going on there, including articles and a lot of great discussion on all the stuff that's come out today really really hope you guys check that out i am bridger signing off ladies and gentlemen and uh we're not going to have any special uh after post show discussion because this has just been too long so maybe we'll get we'll get to that <laughs> next week but uh we'll sign off or after the after the after the song happens we got to have a song here so mm -hmm. um thanks everybody for tuning in have a good night Bye. good night everyone Bye.